Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Well, have you ever stopped to think about how spiritual transformation even works? In today's study in the Key Chapters of God's Word, we're looking at Psalm 119, verses 113 to 144, just to see more of the heart of the psalmist and explore how we are transformed by the Lord through His Word. Now, we've been listening to Psalm 119 for three days now. As you've been reading through these words here, you've noticed that we've even talked about how virtually every one of these verses mentions the Word of God in some form or another. And when we first hear that, we're like, oh, that's a cool piece of trivia. But after 176 verses where virtually everyone does talk about the Word of God, they all kind of maybe begin to blur together. And so I find it helpful to approach this psalm kind of like chicken soup. If you think about chicken soup, it's got a lot of broth, it tastes great, and there's also chunks of really good stuff in it. And so the constant repetition of the Word of God here in this psalm is the broth. It's important. Drink that in. But then as we just drink that broth here, let's just slurp on all the other stuff too, because each verse is going to give us just something to chew on, some new morsel just to just bring into our soul here. And so as you go through this whole chapter, all of Psalm 19, read the verses, meditate upon them, and look at each new truth that the author is giving us and let those principles seep into your soul, into your heart, so that you yourself would be nourished with these words and ultimately reflect the psalmist's heart as well. So that's just more background thoughts here. Now let's dive into our next passage, starting in verse 113. Verse 113 says, I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your law. Well, now, whenever we read verses like hate, it it makes us feel uncomfortable here. It just seems like we're not supposed to hate anyone. But we need to remember that this psalm is an acrostic, and the first letter of every section begins with that that letter of that section. And so we're in the psalmic section. Psalmic is that S sound, and the first word of this verse is sane. And that means anything from a deep hatred to just being set against something. For instance, in Exodus 18, 21, Moses appointed leaders who were set against, the same word sane, covetousness. And so the psalmist is telling us here that he's totally not cool with those who are double-minded. That is, those who are trying to follow the Lord as well as the world. And this just shows us the high value the author places on pure devotion to the Word of God. And when we're like the psalmist here, uh, those who know God and walk with him just see how profoundly insightful his truths are. How, how his word makes sense of life and gives us wisdom and grace to pursue the Lord. And we, we even see the utter emptiness of every competing theory about the Lord. And so it's not that we want people to suffer. We just want to keep people on the pure, devoted path of the Lord and not the path of the world. And well, adding to this idea of total devotion to the Lord, we go to the next set of verses. And it says in verse 114, You are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Depart from me, evildoers, that I may observe the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your word, that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Uphold me, that I may be safe, that I may have regard for your statutes continually. And so these verses show us the psalmist's devotion to the Lord. But they also teach us something else. They teach us, that, and they show us, that our ability to live out any biblical principle in life is 100% dependent upon the Lord. We find refuge in him. We wait for him. He sustains us according to his word. He is the one who gives us life. He is the one who upholds us. We cannot live any spiritual principle without the Lord's present current work in our life. Now, there are times when people reduce biblical Christianity to checkbox Christianity. Checkbox Christianity lives by checking off things we're supposed to do. Read my Bible every day. Check. Serve somewhere in the church. Somewhere from some time. Yeah, check. Uh, Tell people we're praying for them. Check. And while we have checked off every box, we can do these things without walking with the Lord. And sometimes that's exactly what's going on. And yet throughout this psalm, we have seen the issue is not simply filling our head with more and more knowledge, more and more theology. It's about walking closely with the Lord that we would walk with him according to his word. That's why you see the psalmist constantly crying out to the Lord to, to put life in him, to give insight to him, so that everything he's doing is being done really as the work of God in his life. For instance, in verse 116, he's asking the Lord to sustain him. In verse 117, he's asking the Lord to uphold him. In verse 124, he's asking the Lord to teach him. In verse 125, he's asking the Lord to give him understanding. In verse 133, he's asking the Lord to establish his footsteps. Now, if you've ever seen my Bible, if you go to our church here, then you know I make extensive use of underlining verses with specific colors. I got this whole little coding system. If you want to get it, just email me and I'll send it to you. 
But I do this color coding because it just helps me be able to see visually what's going on here. And so I use for like God's work, I'll often use just this light purple pen. And so if you look at my Bible, I'm just going to give you a whole bunch of verses here um, that are just underlined and that light purple is just showing it's God who does the work. So that's verse 4, 10, 11, 12, 18, 19, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 38, 40, 43, 64, 66, 68, 173, 88, 90, 93, 102, 108, 116, 117, 124, 133, 135, 144, 169, and 171. Now that's a ton, and I probably even missed a few, but it's just this underlying principle here that unless the Lord is doing the work in us, it's not going to happen. And so unless the Lord is an actual living, present part of our life in Christ, we will just be descending into checkbox Christianity. And so the solution to this checkbox Christianity or this deterioration of our faith is to cry out to the Lord with the kind of repeated regularity that we see here in this passage. We're basically daily asking him to teach us his word, to to give us a heart to obey it, to to give us a deeper love for it, to give us greater and deeper, richer insights. And when you think about it, if the psalmist had to do this with this kind of regularity, I mean, it's just repeated so many times in this passage here. What makes us think that we're better than him? If he needs to ask the Lord just to give him this kind of a heart because he just knows that his flesh is constantly trying to just take back over again, we need to be coming back to the Lord also and just saying, give me a heart to understand. Give me a desire to obey your word. Teach me your instructions. Teach me your insights and your word. Because without the Lord doing the work in our life, we're not going to really have any real understanding of what his word is saying. Now, along those lines, I'd like for us now to focus on three other verses in this section that just tie in how God works in our life. If you look at verses 124, 130, 144, they all get to the same idea. Verse 124 says, Deal with your servant according to your loving kindness and teach me, teach me your statutes. Now look down at verse 130. Verse 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And now if you look over at verse 144, it says, Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Now, we've seen these kind of petitions throughout this psalm here, but again, I've really just needed to pace myself so we don't have 45-minute podcasts with every one of these episodes here. Uh, But these verses are showing us what we are seeing so many other times here, that all true spiritual wisdom insight must come from the Lord. Here's the thing. We are born into this world spiritually dead. Theologians can unpack what that means, but basically what it means is we can hear spiritual truth, but it doesn't get past our ears into our soul. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 2.14, where the natural man cannot understand the things of God. Let's turn our Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. This is a passage where we should just unline our Bibles and just be aware of and what it says and what it means. So hopefully you've got 1 Corinthians 2.14 open. It says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In other words, a person who does not have the presence of God enabling them and guiding them into spiritual truth won't understand it. Now, we're not talking about here a worldly sense of spirituality. The world loves to say that they're spiritual but not religious. Uh, That's the world's sense of spirituality. That's not biblical Christianity or biblical spirituality. Biblical spirituality is living a life in fellowship with the living Lord Jesus, where we're not following checkbox Christianity. And we live in fellowship with the Lord as we cry out to him, asking him to give us understanding through his word, like we're seeing throughout this psalm here in Psalm 119, where the Lord is the one who opens our mind and just feeds our soul through his word. Now, the fancy term for this, if you're writing something down here, here's the word they write down. It's called illumination. That's the fancy term for this. And illumination is a lot like it sounds. It's the idea where the Holy Spirit turns on the light bulb of our soul to understand spiritual truth. Now, another common word for this in the New Testament is epinosis. That's a Greek word. It's two Greek words, gnosis, meaning knowledge, smushed with epi, meaning above. And the idea is that you're kind of looking down from above, and as you're just learning this knowledge, you're eventually, through spiritual wisdom and insight, seeing how the pieces fit together. And illumination only happens by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. The problem is, all around us, people are claiming to have spiritual wisdom and insight, and often they don't. Um, I would suggest that there are maybe three kinds of illumination. First, there's the, the real illumination, the true illumination from the Holy Spirit, where we just see how the pieces fit together. And that's what the psalmist is asking for throughout Psalm 119. But then there's also a borrowed illumination, and, and that's not really bad. But it's where we're reading God's Word. But with the insights that we're getting, it's really just from derived from like other books, commentaries, scholars, things like that. 
That's not bad, and it's way better than nothing. But really, as we discussed yesterday, anyone who is surrendered to the Lord and just seeking to understand it, the Lord will give them wisdom and insight, and they'll even surpass their teachers at times. And it's just a beautiful thing when you see that happening. But, and here's the dangerous one, there is also a false illumination. And I think this is unfortunately really common in our world because there are people who are, who are just, they make their, their stock and trade just coming up with insights about the Bible that it never intended to say. And this kind of false illumination is when people just think the Bible means anything they want it to say, or they just believe things it says that it doesn't say. They just run with any thought that occurs to them, or, or maybe they just come to conclusions that are just way off what the passage means. Now, personally, I've done this many times. It's, it's actually something we probably all do from time to time. I've had times where I've read God's word and I just see things from a certain perspective and, and I'm convinced I'm right. But then I grow and understand what God's word really is saying and I realize, oh, I was way off. I didn't understand it at all. Now, false illumination is not great when it's just ourselves and our own personal Bible study, but it is very dangerous when it's a teacher who is standing up and just proclaiming what he is saying as though it's actually true. They like to look for some kind of cool way of handling a passage, some kind of way no one's ever done it before, so that you know their congregation is like, whoa, that's cool. But that's not only dangerous, it's actually going against God's word. Uh, our goal is not to sound spiritual. Our goal is not to go beyond what is written, the Bible says. Our goal is not to update God's word and make it more, more popular for today. Our goal is to teach God's word faithfully and accurately and let the Holy Spirit apply it to people's lives. Because again, those who are walking in fellowship with the Lord, they're going to hear God's word. It's going to be food for their soul. And what worries me is that scripture prophesies that this just false teaching, this false use of God's word is just going to increase and increase in the end times. And it'll be a time when people just don't want to hear truth. They just want to hear what's just pleasing to them, what sounds good to them. And along those lines, why don't we turn to another passage in the New Testament that just is very frightening because it talks about these things directly. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, go ahead and take a moment, pause the podcast if you need to. Uh, this is just a very important passage for us to know exists so that we understand why we need to have a heart like we see in the, the psalmist in Psalm 119. So hopefully you've got 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 open. Let's look at verses 9 to 12. It says, that is the one who's coming in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And so here you're seeing that this, this, uh, the Antichrist, this false teacher, will, will give all kinds of great teaching. People will love it because they don't love the truth. 11, verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. And so that's the state of the end times. But that may also happen in people's lives today. What will keep us from being one of these people who do not love the truth so as to be saved? Well, we need to be like the psalmist in Psalm 119. We need to daily just study God's word and, and pray and call out to him that we would know his truth asking him to give us wisdom and insight based on his truth so that we'd understand God's word rightly, that we might live it rightly. And so as we flip back to Psalm 119, that's all the time we have for today. It's already been a long podcast, but I'd encourage you to go through the rest of this section here up to verse 144. Read these verses and prayerfully meditate on each one and what they're saying about the psalmist's view of God and his word. And as you work through them, if your view of God or his word matches what you see there written, why not use that just to praise God for the work he has done in your life? Because if you love God's word the way you're seeing here in scripture, that's God who has given that to you. But if your view doesn't match what you're seeing in scripture, and that's probably going to be most of the time, then each time you come across one of these truths, bring that to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to have this kind of a heart. Help me to have this kind of a love for you and your word and desire to obey you. And ask the Lord just to give you that kind of a heart that we see here in this passage. Well, with that, I think we'll just wrap things on up there. I know I've left some great stuff on the cutting floor here. Maybe we'll pull some of them together in tomorrow's study as we finish out this great psalm. Until then, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening, and God bless.